am about to fall asleep. I, I finished the preps for the show about, I don't know, 45 minutes ago, 50 minutes ago. So I'm like, oh, I have time for dinner before the show. So I had my dinner and I ate, it was really good. So I ate a lot. I had a lamb shahi korma, that, which was in the slow cooker all day. And I ate it and then I was like, I want to go to sleep. <laughs> I wanted to go lie down and go to sleep. But uh, I didn't because I have a show to give. It's good to see you guys. I'm glad you're here. I wasn't late. I wasn't late. See, I think I, I turn it on as soon as it hits 730 on my computer and it might be not 100% synced with YouTube, whatever it is. But I do it when it says 730 on my computer. So that's what it is. I got this out of my garden today and I was so happy, so happy because last year our carrot crop just sucked. They were little tiny thingies. They weren't more than, you know, the tip of, of the pen. And this year we did a much better job. They were much better. I was like, you don't know. I was so happy when I pulled those out. That was just a, a just one handful. And I discovered that what you need to do is just plant them earlier and let them, let them, uh, wait longer let them stay in that dirt so we have to pr plant them like super early as soon as the ground thaws and then keep and I planted them from seeds those are from seeds not from seedlings uh, and then just let them stay in there for a long long time it's almost the end of October so I'm thinking carrots should be harvested around here the end of October which is very very late we will often get a first snowfall first we're only getting I planted two beds we're only harvesting one of the beds and then the other bed, because carrots are biennials, they'll f um, make the seeds next year. So I want to leave one of the beds there so that we can get the seeds from it next year. But I was, I was so happy with this. Those were nice, big carrots. Once you start gardening, you get happy with a nice big bumper crop of carrots. Other thing that's going on, my wood stove is almost done. As you can see, there's, there's just a little part missing. It's almost finished, but the elbow that they had with them yesterday didn't fit right, so they had to order a new one. And um, they were supposed to come by this morning and finish it up, but I got a call this afternoon saying, hey, the part just got here. And I'm like, great, so you coming over? And they're like, no, we're not coming over now. We'll come over tomorrow. So they're gonna come tomorrow morning and finish it. But that that's the last bit. They put in the whole new liner in my chimney and set up that whole wood stove. It takes wood, wood, not wood pellets. So um, I'm pretty excited about it. It's not as big as I thought it would be, which is good. When the guy was describing it, I thought it was gonna take up a lot more of the room and I was a little concerned, but I'm very, very happy with that. And I'd love to see Black Magic comment on it because he, this is the type of thing he does, but I don't think he's in there. He's probably working right now. Um, this was, this was a prep that I'd been worried about for quite some time because I knew, like I said months ago, if shit hits the fan tomorrow, we have enough food and water, but we'll freeze to death over the winter because we won't get oil deliveries. This was the big thing that allows us basically to survive. Now, I've still got tons of uh, construction going on in my house because there are structural problems and I thought we were getting the new beam in this week, but apparently we're not. You know what, you guys, can you make some suggestions to me in the chat, in email, whatever you wanna do, for how to get my contractor to fucking show up for work? Because my contractor, he's making progress, but a lot more slowly than I think he should be. Uh, I had thought that we would be done around now, um, maybe next week, you know, when we first started. Now he's talking about end of end of November, possibly beginning of December, and I I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated. So any and I mean sometimes he shows up and sometimes he doesn't. And I get there's things that are done outside that you can't do in the rain. I understand that, but like there was some stuff he was supposed to do inside today, and he just didn't show up. So it, you know anything you guys can suggest. You say Steve Pellis, fresh baked cinnamon rolls and coffee. Maybe, um, Jay Simpson says a shield behind the stove would be good. There actually is one, they haven't put it in yet. I think that's one of, another one of the last things that they're gonna do. I think there's a shield that goes there as well. Don't quote me on that, but there's just a teensy little bit of stuff that needs to be finished up. 6079 Smith, did you pay him already? Well, we did half to start and then he gets the other half later. 
you know, it's a typical uh, agreement that you would have with a contractor. The thing is that I can't, I can't tell him, you know what, screw you, I'll find somebody else. I had four contractors come in and look at the house. He was the only one who called me back. Like the other, the other three came and they looked at it and then they wouldn't return my calls or my emails. So he's the only one who actually got in touch with me again. Uh, if I let him go now, first of all, my house is on stilts. Basically, it's it's jacked up and there's a big hole in the wall. Um, I can't leave in the middle of the project. And then I'm not sure I could get anybody else to come finish it up. I'm kind of stuck with him. I'm kind of stuck with him. Uh, yeah, Alkman says, remind him that he has a contract with a lawyer. The thing is that... Um, I think you catch more flies with honey. Uh, so I think maybe the, the cinnamon rolls and the coffee might help. I might need to put my foot down a little bit, but I need to be careful about doing that. I don't want him to start getting pissed off and that sort of thing. I, I just I just want him to show up for work and finish it up. That enough about that. Um, I'm gonna, well, St. Chilby says maybe offer a bonus by a certain date. Uh, I might do that and see if we can figure that in there. But yeah, I'm pretty frustrated at this point. Jay Stimson says contractors are busy these days. Yeah, I know, but we were supposed to be done by now. It was like eight weeks ago. He said seven weeks, but he had another project to finish up. But after he started, it would be seven weeks. Well, I think it's been six of those seven and he's got a month of work left to do. Like he had, he just hasn't been doing the work. So I'm frustrated. Moving on from that, because we don't, I could, I could complain about that for hours. Um, here's something else that's going, some, some good news. I, uh, at the grocery store, the local grocery store in town, they were selling dry beans for 20 cents a pound. I've been talking about this on Facebook. I couldn't believe it. I went out and I got 200 pounds of beans, dry beans from the local grocery store for 40 bucks, $40 for 200 pounds of beans. I would have gotten more, but there's a storage issue. Like, where am I going to put them all? And then also um, they were running out, so there's not much of it left. Tomorrow, uh, I have to take Isaac to Manchester and I think I'll stop by like a Sam's Club and get a bunch of rice to go with that. But that was pretty exciting. And this rice and beans wouldn't really be for us because we, we actually have enough of that. It would be for other families that, let's say my cousins who live in Boston show up unexpectedly saying, help us, help us, or if I wanted uh, to form some sort of uh, agreement with the neighbors for defense or something, then I have something to give them. So it's basically to uh, provide for family members who show up unexpectedly or to give to other people for some sort of truce. But we are running out of time. We are running out of time. The election is November 3rd. As I said many times, I don't expect the world to end on November 3rd. I do think that we are going to see an escalation over a period of months, which is still quite rapid, even if it's not overnight. This is still, even though the world's not gonna end on the third, it's gonna become increasingly difficult as time passes for you to get supplies, if things go the way that I'm expecting them to go. So now would be a really good time to get any kind of final things that you wanna get. Not only things like rice and beans, that's the cheapest prepper food, but also some things that are really important. They're very shelf stable and they're important for preparing food or for preserving food. Mason jars, it's probably too late for you to get mason jars. If you see some, great. You can look around for them, but they're actually super hard to get right now. Mason jar, because I'm not the only one who sees this coming. Mason jars, mason lids. Okay, some of the things that you should be able to get are things like white sugar. It's a very important preservative. Salt is a super important preservative, white sugar salt. And for salt, you need pickling salt and iodized salt. Mostly you need pickling salt. Pickling salt is different from iodized salt. Pickling salt doesn't have an anti-caking agent, so it's much better for food preservation. Olive oil um, is cheap for what you're getting. You don't have to get the super like extra version, you know, $20 an ounce olive oil, but you can get a big old jug of olive oil and not like corn oil, get olive oil um, in big jugs. And uh, it lasts for two years. Look at the date on it because it may have already been sitting in the grocery store for a while. But if it's relatively fresh at the time you get to the grocery store and you get it soon, it la it's shelf stable for like over two years as long as you keep it in a place that's like room temperature. 
Uh, don't freeze it uh, and don't let it get super, super hot, you know. But in, in a room temperature environment, it keeps for two years. Ghee is a type of shelf stable butter. It's um all the impurities are taken out of it. It doesn't it doesn't have as strong of a flavor as butter, but it's made from butter. So uh, ghee will keep I think for over a year. Honey is a very important preservative. It'll last forever as long as it's stored properly. Vinegar and alcohol, yeah, alcohol. But you can get the good stuff for um for you know just having a drink or something but you get a lot of the cheap alcohol for food preservation and also for medicinal reasons it's a really good antiseptic um, and alcohol is also important for trading those are some of the things you could be getting right now sugar salt olive oil ghee honey vinegar and alcohol not an exhaustive list as i'm sure you can imagine let me do one more update and then i'll look at a lot of the comments before we get into some of the new stuff so this is an update on lauren chen uh, the other day i talked about she was doing a gofundme and didn't have quite enough she was asking for ninety thousand dollars for her father's surgery i think she's lowballing i think it's gonna i think his treatment the surgery and his subsequent treatment are going to be a lot more than that. My nephew had cancer and his treatment was in the hundreds of thousands, like plural, not 90,000, hundreds of thousands. So when she says 90,000, I think she's lowballing it. Um, and there's a link in the other day's uh, description and <laughs> I didn't put it in today's description, but there was um, an update. He had his surgery yesterday. This is the message from Lauren Chen. This is a picture of her dad. A tired but happy dad, last night's surgery took longer than anticipated with some unforeseen challenges. That means the surgery had more complications than they were expecting. And it looks like we'll need more testing and treatment to keep the cancer at bay. For now, though, he's on the mend, good, and enjoying some jello and broth. So good for Lauren Chen's dad, and I hope he gets better soon. All right, jumping over to a bunch of the comments. By the way, I've got three screens going on. I got this one, which is the YouTube screen. I've got my Camtasia screen and I've got my OBS screen. When I'm on one of those other two, I can't see the chat and I can't see the super chats. I try to read as many uh, chats as I can. If you do a super chat, I'll read it as soon as I see it. But if I'm on some of the other um, uh, pages, then I can't see the chat. I'll, I'll see it as soon as I get back to this page. Uh, Mike B says, big jugs are better. Awesome. Elva Carroll, Laurel, see if you can order some tepary beans to grow. Okay, I haven't heard of those. That's interesting. I'll probably be away from people on the third. Hunting, oh, I see. I thought you were saying you eat the tepary beans and then you're away from people. But you mean like on November 3rd, you're just gonna get away from people. Yeah, and, and I'm gonna keep saying it uh, today and then again on Sunday. On November 3rd, get out of the cities. If you need to vote, vote and then get the heck out of there. I, if you're in the city and you wanna vote on election day, vote first thing in the morning and then get the hell out of there. Just just go. Cause there's, I, I think it's likely that some stuff is gonna happen. Just get the heck out of there. I'm gonna be voting in person on November 3rd. There's no early voting around here and I was not gonna be voting by absentee ballot. Um, but I'm not, I'm not in this city. I, we should be okay here. Graham Godfrey says, nothing left to burn in Philly. We'll talk about the Philly story a little bit later on. Altman says, Laurel, you want to feed the quote, if something happens, I'm coming to your place. You better be able to arm the ones you want and bury the ones you don't. Um, yeah, I, and I have mixed feelings about having food that you plan to give to somebody else. And, um, I'm gonna be very careful and probably apprehensive about even giving it to neighbors. The problem with giving any food to anybody else is then they know you have food. And even if you trust the person that you're giving it to or that you're telling, they may tell somebody else that they trust foolishly. They trust, but you never would. So it's not just do you trust the person, but do you trust them their judgment and trusting other people. They may mention it in passing to someone else, not thinking anything of it, and then it's that other person who show, who shows up at two o'clock in the morning with a, a bunch of people and guns. So, you know, be it's the same thing with um, 
just in, in regular everyday life, if you ha don't keep a bunch of cash in your house, if you do make sure you never tell anybody ever whatsoever, because you may, you know, let your, your good friend know. And then in passing, they tell somebody else and don't think anything of it. Um, so just, it's, it's something that I've considered even as I get these extra supplies is under what circumstances would I give them to somebody else? We shall see. Elva Carola says, tepary beans are probably the most drought tolerant crop on earth. Well, that's great where you live in New Mexico, but I'm in New Hampshire and we have plenty of water. So I'm not sure I would actually need that, but I appreciate it. And I'm going to say this name right this time, Thermopylae. The Canadian provincial health plans will cover some of the costs, but not all. So that might explain her estimate. Well, she's getting a lot of it. Will they, they pay for people to get surgery in the U.S.? But she was wise to go to the U.S. for treatment. Okay, so I don't know whether they cover any of it while she's uh, to get it done here. And Burles, we have some violence in my neighborhood, but it's regular uncouth stuff and not political at all. We really don't have a lot of that uh, going on here. Bill says, hard to hide the fact that you have chickens. The thing about the chickens is actually most people around here have chickens. Both of my neighbors on, on both sides, they have chickens. Yeah, the people across the street don't, um, but uh, there's, there's lots of chickens all over, so it's not, I'm less concerned about people knowing that I have chickens. Except, of course, if everybody gets hungry, then they'll, they'll go for everybody's. Alrighty. We shall see. All right. Okay, so the first story, it's <laughs> 747. I'm just getting to the first story. This is Melbourne, Melbourne, Australia. And uh, they are supposedly free. This is, this is a celebration of their freedom from the COVID lockdowns. So first we'll, we'll do their celebrations and then we'll talk about these crazy lockdowns they've had. And you can formulate your own opinion on whether they're actually free now. So, but we'll start with some of the celebrations that they've been having over in Melbourne. By the way, if you're in or near Melbourne, um, I'm happy for you that things aren't as bad as they were. So we'll watch this clip. The first guy up here <laughs> who's opening this, he's going to tell everybody welcome, come in. He seems to be from Ireland. That is not an Australian accent. That sounds like an Irish accent. But we'll go ahead and uh, watch this whole clip. I now officially declare Melbourne restaurants open for business. things like this even though it's not a packed bar or anything like that just taking some steps to that normal that we all used to really take for granted so, yeah. yeah i'm so excited to enjoy my first pint of guinness it's been far too long and i don't have enough words and it's like in my vocab <laughs> to describe how excited i am for this so can i say to all of those in melbourne in particular and across victoria Again, congratulations, and I hope you enjoy being out and about. I know you've been waiting a long time for that. And I would just encourage you to, as you open safely, that's the way to remain safely open um, into the future. Uh, but I'm sure it has been quite a day and quite a, a late night for some down there in Melbourne. I can completely understand that. They have to wear masks outside but, still. Do you have a paper? Vivian Bunnings? No. Okay, so they're all celebrating their freedom. L let me just look at one comment here. Uh, Mark M says, that was odd, Laurel, you disappeared midstream. Mid Did I? That would be odd. I hope I came back. Uh, so they are supposedly free now, but not really. When they talk about in this other clip, uh, what, what restrictions have just been lifted, it's kind of shocking what's just been lifted, but then they talk about what they're still under, what restrictions they're still under. They don't sound free to me. Now is the time to open up. 
Now is the time to congratulate every single Victorian for staying the course. From midnight tomorrow, retail will reopen with density limits. Hospitality reopens with indoor and outdoor caps. As well, beauty and personal services, but a mask must be worn. The four reasons to leave home will be removed. And any number of households can meet outside, but no more than 10 people. OK, so that's an inconsistency between what he said and what's on the screen. He says no more than 10 people, but on the screen it says no limit. <laughs> I think what he said is correct. Non-contact sport for adults can resume. Outdoor religious gatherings will be allowed for up to 20 people. OK, wait. So this is removing restrictions. Is religious gatherings no more than 10 people indoors? That's lifting the restrictions? Well, 10 people can attend indoor services. Up to 10 will be allowed at weddings and up to 20 at funerals. And outdoor entertainment... 10 people at the wedding and 20 at funerals. This is, this is freedom. Entertainment venues can seat 50 people. We'll have to wait until tomorrow to get an idea what home visits will look like. The idea of household bubbles seemingly gone. We don't want to do a bubble. I don't know what a household bubble is. Because we think that can be a particularly confusing. The most dangerous environment for the spread of this virus is in your home. Are they going to try to stop it in my home? Oh. Two weeks, Australia further home? restrictions will be eased. From 11.59 on November 8, you'll be able to travel more than 25... Okay, so right now, uh, until November 8th, more than a week from now, they're still limited to, 20, to driving 25 kilometres from home, which is about 15 or 16 miles. So even now when they're free, they can't drive more than 16 miles from their house. Kilometres from home. The ring of steel around Melbourne will be gone. Gyms and fitness studios can reopen with density limits. Hospitality venues can then seat 40 people inside and 70 outside. Caps on religious gatherings. Even after November 8th, which they're saying is going to be another uh, point of freedom, even then they're saying no more for religious gatherings, then they can go up to 20 people inside. It will be increased to 20 inside and 50 outside, while 20 mourners can attend indoor funerals and 50 outdoors. Non-contact indoor sports will resume for under-18s. Indoor pools will reopen, allowing up to 20 swimmers. And accommodation will also reopen. Wait, wait, wait. They haven't had hotels open in three months? It's been three months. No, more than that. It's been uh, 112 days that they haven't had hotels open? Reopen. This belongs to every single Victorian. Yeah, it does belong to everybody. I, I've been frustrated that Americans haven't stood up for their rights as much as I think that they should have. But Australia, man, you got to stand up for yourselves. And I know that's easier said than done. Wow. Wow. I just, it's shocking how bad things are in Australia. I can't. That just to see how bad things have been for how long it's been that bad. You know, um, the U.S. and Australia have a lot in common culturally and historically. There's a lot of parallels that have, have happened. And I, I used to think that our cultures had a lot of uh, important similarities. And one of them I thought was this, this thirst for freedom and for individuality. And I have learned that uh, that is not correct. That is not correct. There's a lot of Americans who've really disappointed me with that, but in comparison, wow, wow, things got bad in Australia. And uh, oh, man, what can I say? You gotta start standing up for yourselves. You, you can't, like you can't do this. And, and again, I know it's easier said than done, but and I'm asking myself, am I doing enough to prevent that kind of oppression really it's oppression they weren't letting people they're, they're still not they're still not letting people drive more than 16 miles from their houses that's oppression they they can't have more than 10 people at a church in inside that's oppression that that is oppression what's happening right now wow wow Bo Bob Cal says, I called the Australian embassy and chewed them out for their police brutality against non-mask wearers. Good. 
Uh, Jay Stimson, welcome to 1984. Yeah, it may be 2020 in the United States, but it's 1984 in Australia. Where's Rational Wrong Think to explain his country? <laughs> He's not going to defend it. He'll be like, yeah, I know. Okay, uh, going over, that's what's happening in Australia, so or Melbourne. I'm, I'm happy that at least they can go out to restaurants again. Oh, my goodness. And if they're only just now allowing 10 people into churches, does that mean they haven't had any church services in 112 days? <sighs> Moving on. That's the first story. Okay, so the next story, this, is, this goes along the lines of what we just watched in terms of um, craziness over coronavirus. This is a report that was put out by the CDC. And, and uh, I, I wasn't aware of this. The I, I learned about this through Matt and Blonde's show on Sunday. Before I get to it, I got a super chat from Bad Karma PA, five bucks. Thank you. At work, can't hang, can't hang out. I'll watch the replay. Awesome. <clears throat> okay, going over here. No, I can't remember where I was. Here I was. For the coronavirus, this was the story. And uh, I learned about this on Latin Blonde show. It's a report that was just put out, and this is the total number of excess deaths. This is interesting because what they've done is they look at how many deaths they normally see in an average year, and that's the expected level of death. And they're looking at how many more deaths have they seen than they would normally expect. That gives us a better idea of what the toll of all of this is. Now, when I say all of this, I don't just mean COVID. I mean, COVID plus any other excess deaths, not directly attributed to COVID, but possibly to the extreme lockdown measures. This was something interesting from the, um, from the, the report, and there's a link in the description down below. Overall, an estimated 299,028 excess deaths, about 300,000 uh, very close to 300,000 excess deaths have occurred in the United States from late January through October 3rd, 2020, with two thirds of these attributed to COVID-19. Okay, so if two thirds are attributed to COVID, one third isn't. That's 100,000 deaths that are not because of the virus itself. So where, what's causing this other 100,000 deaths? And that is most likely, although this data is preliminary and it's going to take probably a number of years to really examine all of this data and get at the heart of the matter. Um, but some theories for what these other 100,000 excess deaths are, it's going to be suicides, deaths of despair, alcohol and drugs. Um, it's going to be people not getting proper medical treatment for other conditions such as stroke or cancer screening. Um, so there is a, a third of these excess deaths is probably from these other things that I just mentioned. When we And when we look at the two thirds that they are attributed, attributing to COVID-19, keep in mind some of the stuff that's been reported previously, not only on my live streams, but on a bunch of other channels. A number of public health officials have openly admitted that if a person dies and had COVID, even if it's even if it was a motorcycle accident that they clearly died from, if they test positive for COVID, it's listed as a COVID death. And there's even people who didn't test for COVID at all at all, but just based on the symptoms, they're presumed to have COVID. So even when we're looking at that 200,000 that is supposedly attributed to COVID-19, is it really? Or are these, for example, the motorcycle accident where he was listed as a COVID-19 death? We won't know for sure for many years how much was COVID and how much was deaths because of this crazy disruption to life and society. And also, this is important, the largest percentage increase were seen among adults aged 25 to 44 and among Hispanic and Latino persons. We know that the disease, the, the average age of COVID death is in the late 70s or early 80s. If you look at a number of sources, you'll get a different estimate of what the average age is. But um, most of the sources are gonna say it's actually 
over life expectancy. I think life expectancy is around 77, and a lot of sources say the average age of a COVID death is 78. Uh, but definitely not 25 to 44. The largest percentage increases were seen among adults aged 25 to 44 and among Hispanic and Latinos. So those aren't COVID deaths. Or they're, if they are, then it's people who were very sick from something else, most likely. Um, cause that's not most of the, the pe that age range is not most of the people have COVID. So we also don't know whether the lockdowns saved anybody, but we can't, it's very difficult to say that because even if you look at, uh, the lockdowns suppressing the number of people catching it or dying from it. For how long? Because you can't, are you going to keep this up for years? So are you just postponing it for a few months? And then you've done all of this and you've destroyed the economy and you've gotten some of these other excess deaths. And then the person catches it a few months later anyway, because it is going to make the rounds. It's so contagious. Did you really save anybody or did you simply postpone it by a few months? And then are these other excess deaths that are not COVID deaths, were those 100% avoidable if you didn't do these lockdowns? So maybe these deaths, we won't know. There's, it's very difficult to know, but maybe these deaths from COVID were unavoidable over the next few years. We've, we've um, or there would have been other ones that uh, you've only postponed, but the other excess deaths, those 100,000 that weren't COVID those were completely preventable if you didn't do these lockdowns. It's very difficult to say because the data is too early, but um, I have a lot of concerns about whether any of this is helping or whether it's doing more harm than good. Mark M, 15 bucks. If you'd expect voting day disturbances, then why not in early voting? Because it would tip their hands. Uh, Ford Observer, and I'll mention him again later on, uh, mentioned in his intelligence report that I read today, in the, in the far left circles, they are telling people, wait until after the election. Obviously, there is a riots in Philadelphia the past two nights, but generally around the country, they're telling a lot of their people who are willing to listen, wait until the election, wait until the election and after. And that's part of why we haven't seen as much activity lately with the notable exception of Philadelphia the past two days. So um, that's why, probably why we haven't seen much disturbances for early voting. There's been a few incidents, but not that much. Beans, bullets, bandages. I work in mental health. So I agree with you, Arkham, Mark M. I work in mental health. Suicides and ODs are way up with my agency. We are screening twice as many people in the ER for psych hospitalization as a year ago. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of these, a lot of these non-COVID excess deaths were preventable and whether the COVID deaths were preventable is uncertain. And Burroughs Laurel is tally back on YouTube. No, thank you for asking. He is on BitChute. He only has a couple of followers, it's like 600 followers on, on BitChute. Um, his channel on YouTube hasn't been deleted. If you want to find him on BitChute, I'm sorry I didn't uh, I didn't get a link for in the description, but he is Clown World News on BitChute. He's not tally 2110 LOL. He's Clown World News on, on BitChute. Um, hope Tally's channel has not been deleted on YouTube. So hopefully he's just in YouTube purgatory and they will let him come back soon. Uh, it's okay to be clown pilled and ace in case anyone was, is wondering right leaning folks aren't on board with mask tyranny. <laughs> Mike B mental health is racist. <laughs> um, alrighty. Okay, let's, oh, uh, there's a few for my, my son gets mad if I don't read his comments and he actually lives here, so I have to deal with it. Uh, Isaac says, whatever happened to the clown pilled meme from like a year ago, that should make a comeback. Yeah, they would be great. The, all the clown stuff was awesome. I'll read, I'll read one more and then I'm going to get back to the news. Aukman says, Laurel, I know of a patient who refused to come to our office to get examined because of COVID. Wow. It wasn't what they thought. The individual was dead a month later. My goodness. 
So there's all of these other excess deaths that are clearly avoidable, clearly avoidable. All right, what's next? So we did CDC, ACB. Okay, so uh, Amy Coney Barrett has been confirmed. She actually got, um, she got confirmed by the Senate, was it last night? I think it was, last night or, or the day before. Um, this is the sound on this is just terrible. The sound is really bad, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and play it, and I think I'll talk over her. I might just turn this. Hi, maybe you can't you can't really hear it anyway, but um, this is her taking the oath of office. That is Clarence Thomas who is administering the oath, and the sound was terrible on all the channels. They, she's not wearing a mic, and neither is Clarence Thomas. So, um, but she did get confirmed. 52 to 48 in the Senate. I am disappointed with Susan Collins. She's the senator from Maine. Susan Collins very famously stood up for Brett Kavanaugh. Um, Susan Collins is a Republican, but for this, she she voted against Amy Coney Barrett. I, you know, obviously I can't vote in Maine, but I'm disappointed with Susan Collins for that. So that was uh, her confirmation. This is, let me make sure I unmute this. This is her uh, acceptance speech. She had a really good acceptance speech. But first I have a little clip of her just after she's sworn in and she's smiling at uh, the president and at Clarence Thomas. Okay, I wanna back up just a sec because she looks at Clarence Thomas. And you can see from the back of him, we're in a kind of an odd angle here, but you can see that he's smiling and she's smiling at him. So she knows Clarence Thomas. She uh, clerked for Scalia. She was the um, law clerk for Scalia after she got out of law school. Scalia and Clarence Thomas were very close. So she would have known Clarence Thomas from back when she was a law clerk. That's why he's the one who swore her in and she's giving him a big smile right there. He's proud of her. It's a good moment. And then she gives a fabulous speech. The confirmation process has made ever clearer to me one of the fundamental differences between the federal judiciary and the United States Senate. And perhaps the most acute is the role of policy preferences. It is the job of a senator to pursue her policy preferences. In fact, it would be a dereliction of duty for her to put policy goals aside. By contrast, it is the job of a judge to resist her policy preferences. It would be a dereliction of duty for her to give in to them. Federal judges don't stand for election. Thus, they have no basis for claiming that their preferences reflect those of the people. This separation of duty from political preference is what makes the judiciary distinct among the three branches of government. A judge declares independence not only from Congress and the President, but also from the private beliefs that might otherwise move her. The judicial oath captures the essence of the judicial duty. The rule of law must always control. She's fabulous. I, I wasn't sure about her when she started, but I really liked what she said in her speech. So uh, I think she's a gem and we're all very lucky to have her. The, all of the Democrats who are speaking out against her, like, why? She's great. She's, she's impartial. She believes in the Constitution. She was an excellent choice. President Trump actually made a really, really good choice with that one. Um, <clears throat> Mouth Man says, can't be a good mom and an attorney. Ask my mom. Hey, Isaac, am I a good mom? Mike Bondinsky, uh, Collins likely voted against confirming Barrett with support and consent of McConnell. McConnell knew he had the votes to confirm and the GOP needs Collins to retain majority hold of the Senate. I, I get that, but when she voted for Kavanaugh, when she stood up for Kavanaugh, she was 
standing up for what's right. And now she's making a political deal. And I'm just, I'm disappointed. I see the deal that she's making. She wants to increase her chances of getting reelected. I would have rather seen her stick to her guns. I, I think um, the people who are intent on voting her out are going to do it regardless. I don't think this is going to really change their decision. I'm close enough to Maine that we sometimes hear the political ads for Maine. And so I've, I've heard on the radio some of the political ads against Susan Collins. They're really coming after her. I don't think that voting against Amy Coney Barrett is going to help her in any way. I, I just don't see it. I don't see it changing the minds of people to get them to vote for her. So we'll see what happens. I think she's out either way, which is a shame. Um, and it would have been better if she'd gone out with integrity instead of going out after making a, a bad political deal. Alrighty. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go on to the next story, which is along these lines, it's related to Amy Coney Barrett getting in there, which is the Democrats have been looking at possibly packing the Supreme Court. It's something that's sort of murmured and when, when it's brought up, they kind of deny it, but they are, let me get rid of a couple of these things. They are apparently not denying it any longer. They're just gonna come out and say it. Um, so this is, oh, dude, fix this. No, go away. So this is Nancy Pelosi just saying straight up, yeah, let's talk about packing the Supreme Court. As the Speaker of the House, are you open to efforts to do that in the future? Well, I think that Joe Biden has given us a good path. He's going to have something that people can understand why this is important. And I like what something that Brian said about not just the Supreme Court, but the other courts. It was a hundred. Oh, well, in 1879, in 1876, there were nine justices on the court. Our population has grown enormously since then. Should we expand the court? Well, let's take a look and see. They're just openly talking about packing the Supreme Court now. They want to, if, if they don't win, and it's looking like they're not going to, despite what the polls say, I just don't believe it. I, there's tons of people at Trump's rallies and there's like nobody at Biden's. Um, and I don't think that fear of COVID fully accounts for that. Since it looks like they're gonna win, they might lose, it, it looks like they're gonna lose. They might lose the White House and still win Congress. And if they do, they might try to pack the Supreme Court so they'll have that one. And if they do get Biden in the White House, which again, I just don't think is gonna happen, they wanna make sure that they never lose again. And packing the Supreme Court would be very important for that. What we're looking at is the Democrats, The left. it used to be extreme left, and now it's even moderate left. It's, she's the Speaker of the House, which means all the other Democrats had to vote for her. The moderate Democrats are now talking about doing things that really undermine our system of government. They really undermine the Republic. They're gonna pack the Supreme Court to make sure that they get their way since they've now, uh, since it now looks like a conservative court. They wanna do some underhanded things. And they also want to get rid of the Electoral College. They've talked about that before. It's not what Nancy Pelosi was talking about there. But um, they just want to completely undermine our system of government. It's a revolution. They're talking about a revolution. They're talking about, in, in the mainstream, they're talking about doing it through uh, political process. But it goes along with the violent extremism so many people on the left, both the moderates and the extremists, are looking to overthrow our current system of government in some way. And that's what this election is about. Are we going to continue as the United States or not? But it's not, it's not just us. It's, it's this whole battle between globalism and patriotism throughout the West and indeed, I think, in some other countries as well. Mike Bundinski, wonder if the Dems would support increasing the numbers of justices on SCOTUS if Trump is reelected and the GOP retains the majority in the Senate. Oh no, then it would be no good. Yep. 
Alrighty. Gary G., the president should announce that he's expanding the court to 15 and submit six names to the Senate. <laughs> and then see how pa fast they pass a resolution saying, no, we're going to make it like permanent that it's nine people. Okay, let's go on down. What's next? Uh, oh, we're finally to the riots. Okay. Go down to this one. As many of you know, uh, I used to live in Philadelphia. I'm actually from just outside of Philly. I'm a, from a little town in New Jersey called uh, Morristown. It's near Cherry Hill. There's a Morristown in North Jersey. I'm from Morristown in South Jersey, uh, near, as I said, Cherry Hill. It's a suburb of Philadelphia. So I always grew up outside of Philly. We got the news from Philadelphia and, and uh, all of our TV stations were there. When we went to sports games, which we did every now and then, we would go see the Philadelphia Phillies, we'd go into, into the city. Um, so I grew up around there and then I went to college in Massachusetts and I went to grad school in North Carolina and then um, lived in a couple of other places. But then I came back to Philadelphia and I lived there for, I guess, five years. I went to law school there. And then after I left Philly, I went to Houston and I lived in Houston for 13 years and then uh, moved back to Philadelphia. And I lived in Philly for three years. I was thinking about staying there. So 21 years, either Philadelphia or Houston. It was five years in Philly, 13 in Houston, and then back to Philly for three years. Uh, and I, when I came back to Philly, I thought I was going to stay. I thought I was going to stay forever. And uh, I decided not to buy a house right away because I'm like, well, I'm not sure what part of the city I want to live in. Uh, so I got an apartment and thank God, because that made it a lot easier to leave. And when I left Philly um, for a number of reasons, one of them was just the crime rate. It was the homeless problem was getting out of control. And I just thought I want to go someplace safer. I, I really wasn't thinking civil war back then. It was actually a few months after I moved that I started thinking along those lines. Uh, but I decided that I wanted to go live in the country, get a couple of acres. I have 1.6 acres here. Um, and I'm glad I made that decision. It's still heartbreaking to see Philadelphia, to see riots in Philly. I, I think of it as my sort of home city. My hometown would be Morristown, but my home city nearby would be Philadelphia. And this just breaks my heart. A lot of these riots, I looked at a bunch of the footage and I don't recognize any of the areas. Uh, I lived in Center City the time that I lived there, the eight years I was there. The first five years I lived um, by 22nd and Bainbridge, which is not that far. It's a good five minute walk south of Rittenhouse Square, five to 10 minutes south of Rittenhouse Square. And then when I lived there most recently, I lived right near the uh, Reading Terminal Market which is they're both they're like on both of those are on the edges of center city isaac says according to spengler's model democracy is supposed to give way to caesarism i okay so these are the riots in philadelphia <laughs> Oh, so what started these riots? I should have said there was a guy who charged the police. He was holding a knife and he charged at them and they shot him. Um, at, at this point, you know, I said before, I, I sort of said, well, you know, I care about justice, but I'm just going to come out and say it. I just don't care about this guy. I, I just absolutely don't care. I, and it really, it doesn't matter what started it off. It, nowadays, it just seems that they're looking for any sort of reason to riot. Um, and it doesn't matter what the details are. So I'm not even going to get into all the details because it just doesn't matter. It doesn't, it's, they were looking for any reason to riot. And it's been the past two nights. It's been the past two nights, not just the last night. So these cops that have blood all over them, there's this one and then there was one earlier. 
That's not necessarily because they hit anybody. Uh, there were reports of people throwing blood on them. This may be blood that was thrown at them. Was it a cop car? Or? I don't know if it was a cop car or I not. I heard it was a cop car, but I, I don't know if a cop car. Definitely a cop car. I was on my way home. This is the middle of 52nd Street. That's the middle of 52nd Street. I didn't say it right though. I can't say 50, 50 second. <laughs> I can't do it. That would be North Philly. I, I think, where was the law school? I think it was around 40th, so. Or just, it's not that far from, from the law school. I went to Temple School of Law. Okay. So, and we're out of focus again. Yay. It breaks my heart to see Philadelphia on fire. Uh, 25 cops were hurt. Uh, people were throwing bricks at them. But all of the cops who were injured are expected to uh, make a full recovery. Tazi says, very peaceful shopping. The, a lot of the um, uh, shops that were hit, you know, are not going to reopen, especially the smaller shops, the mom and pop shops, because they didn't just get places like Walmart. They got a lot of mom and pop shops, too. And they might not reopen. Uh, the rioters think that all these places are going to get money from the insurance. They may have insurance, but a lot of insurance doesn't cover writing or might not cover the entire amount and then there's just the lost business uh, during the time that it takes to fix it so you might have insurance to cover the physical loss of the inventory and the building if you owned it but business disruption insurance is something else it's less common to carry business disruption insurance which is replaces your lost revenue while you're rebuilding if you rebuild so um philadelphia i'm glad that i got out when i did i still hate to see that happen to it uh but you know i i just count my blessings that i left two and a half years ago instead of this happening now and me thinking i gotta get the hell out of here it, it'd be sort of too late at this point i've done so much work to prep i can't imagine starting the preps now so thank god i'm here and not there Okay. I do miss Philly sometimes. My daughter wanted over the summer because we were stuck here and there's just, the, if there's anything bad you can say about rural New Hampshire, it's there's not a lot of really good restaurants. There's not. There's not a lot of restaurants. There's not a lot of coffee shops. I miss the coffee shops. My daughter wanted to do a restaurant vacation in Philly over the summer. And she always complained about Philly when we were living there recently. But over the summer, she's like, can we just go to Philly and stay in a hotel and then just go to restaurants for all of our meals? And she started listing the places she wanted to go to. It was a bunch of the restaurants we went to before. She's like, we can go to all these places. Can we please? And I was like, I just, I don't, it, there was already rioting over the summer. And I said, I think it's too dangerous to go stay in a big city for a couple of days right now. Especially Philly has always had a lot of racial tension. That's not a new thing. That's something. When I moved to Houston, it was very refreshing that I didn't feel that racial tension that I had gotten so used to in the city when I lived in Philly. Like Houston just doesn't have the same level of racial tension that Philadelphia has had for a long time. Moving on, 824. There is another story. I'll, I'll do this one and then I'll look at some more of your comments. But uh, this was, I'm telling you, and I mentioned it before, Project Veritas is on fire. They are on freaking fire. This is another one of their exposés. This is San Antonio, Texas. And uh, it's a woman who's doing ballot harvesting. What she's doing is she calls people and she sort of canvasses the neighborhoods and finds out who might vote 
the way that she wants. And she, she's worked for both parties. If you watch the entire videos, like she's done this for Republicans and Democrats. And I kind of like that they talk about that because when they imply that it's only Democrats that are doing this, I'm like, well, that actually erodes my confidence in this because I, I think it's both sides. So she'll work for either side. Um, but she'll canvass the neighborhood and find out who might actually vote for whoever's paying her. And uh, she will take the absentee ballots to them. She'll help to register them to vote and then she'll get the ballots and take them to them or uh, ask them to let her know when they receive it in the mail. And then she'll go to pick it up. So she offers to pick it up and it hasn't been closed when they get there, when she gets there. So she looks at it. She looks at how they're voting and makes sure that they're voting a certain way. And you'll see in this video, she gets the person to change her vote. She works with a lot of elderly who are gonna be easily swayed. swayed. Not, elder, not all elderly are easily swayed. My mother wouldn't be. My mother would be like calling me saying, this person is doing something they're not supposed to. But some are. And um, so she gets this person to change her vote. Now the other thing she could do is if she sees that they're not voting the way that she wants, and she's supposed to take their ballot away, so probably just throw it away if she couldn't get them to vote the right way. So what she's doing here is extremely illegal. Looking at the way the person is voting and making them change their vote. She voted for John Corgan, okay, Lloyd really Doggett. So this is who she voted for here, all right? So she ba she basically went through the, through the ballot mm -hmm. and picked out, now you know on here, you chose the Republican, not a Democrat, right? Can I, can I do that? You can do. You can vote for whoever you want. But our conversation that we had, you said you were voting for Hager because you were going straight Democrat. So I'm just bringing that to your attention because oh. you could literally change it and put your initials there, and you're fine. Because if you're trying to do a straight Democratic ballot, that is. Um, not a Democrat. You know what I mean? And it's okay because normally what I would do is I'll sit with them and I'll talk to them. If you want to change it, you can, and then uh, you can just put your initials there. So that way you're voting for the straight down. Because that's what you want to do, correct? You want to vote for the entire, all the Democrats. Did you see that? Can I do it like that? I didn't want it all And the only way that you can do that, Mom, is if, if you, uh, you're going to shake the Democrat because you want... Okay, she called her mom, but I think it's just, they're both Latinas. And in Latina culture, they'll often say mama um, because it's an older woman. So I, I think it's just she's saying it to be respectful. If you watch the rest of the video, it, it doesn't look like that's her mother. I think she's just calling her like ma for mama. All Dems, right? And you're going to have to put your like a line through it and your initials, so they're going to know it was a mistake. That's the only way they're going to accept it. She says that's the only way they're going to accept it, implying that she did it wrong and it has to be fixed. It's, that was clearly tampering with the voter, and that's that's really illegal. That is, she can go to prison for that. Mark M, another 15 bucks. Thank you. Laurel, aren't we inexorably getting closer to the point the police will not show up for anyone regardless of political stripe? Uh, yeah, well, that's why I, I got I got my guns, honestly. Yes, we, we are getting closer to that. Either um, the police, and this is already happening in Minneapolis, the police are just afraid to answer certain calls where somebody might be filming and if they do anything wrong at all, they're gonna get raked over the coals. So they're just not answering certain calls. Uh, and <clears throat> everybody suffers. Everybody suffers regardless of their political affiliation. So yes, we are getting very, very uh, dangerously close to that. Isaac says she got a prodigious gullet. <laughs> uh, stocking horse, does she eat what she harvests? You guys are harsh. Alkman, ballot harvesting should be illegal. Well, it is. Well, it depends on the state. So what she's doing, she's tampering with the ballot. So it depends on what you mean by ballot harvesting. In some places, it's okay to pick up the, the completed sealed ballot for somebody 
and uh, and deliver it. So it depends on the state. But what she's doing is not legal anywhere. There's a reason why at the polls, if you go and you vote in person, they have you can only go to the voting booth one at a time. They won't let a spouse in there with you because <clears throat> they don't want one spouse ordering the other spouse what to do. Um, you go in there alone, you close the curtain. The only person you're allowed to have in there, you can have minor children in there with you, your own minor kids. And you can have uh, one of the election judges upon your request, if you're confused about how to use the machine, they can go in there with you, but nobody else is allowed in there with you. And there's a reason why they do that, and that's to prevent this. Doing this on the, the paper ballots, very illegal. And this is one of the problems with the paper ballots, it's much more vulnerable to that type of thing than voting in person. You guys, I bet she puts gravy on her cake. My goodness. <laughs> the angle, I mean, she's, she's heavy, but I mean, so am I. The angle was very unflattering. Uh, Black magic, sup Jay, work's trying to kill me again. Plus I have to get the wood stove going. Go for it. And then later on, uh, Black magic, watch the very beginning of my show because I show you guys my stove. It's missing an elbow, but uh, you can take a look at it and tell me if it's a good one. Black magic, uh, Jay Stimson, do you have Laurel's email? She has my cell number. If you want to do a meetup, texting is the best way to contact me. I'm thinking a Saturday PM, but November might not work. He's not kidding. Like you can't send him an email. He will never answer it. You have to text him. He means it. Alrighty, going on. All right, let me read this one last one. Some of your comments are so good. I just can't stop reading them. Richard Hinman, in Britain, the police disarm criminals with knives without shooting them. Um, it, it depends on the situation. It, it, so, but as I said, it doesn't, it doesn't even matter what it was. It, they're just looking for a reason to, to fight. Patty 62, five bucks. Thank you so much. No note. Alrighty. Uh, moving on to Billy Wright's Veritas. Okay. So we were talking about the election, and that's uh, what I was just showing you, the tampering with the ballots. Election day coming up in just a few days. Ford Observer, and I'm gonna be talking about um, some of the stuff in his most recent intelligence report. I do pay for that. This is how he makes his living. He puts out this intelligence report, so I don't wanna give an excerpt from it, even though I'm not gonna show you the whole thing. I don't wanna give an excerpt from it without giving a little bit of, pl of a plug here, a little bit of advertising for people to go to Forward Observer, it's forwardobserver.com and sign up for their, for his uh, intelligence uh, mailings. Like he emails it, but he also does uh, some other stuff. It's a daily intelligence report. And I think he has some other specials coming up pretty soon because of the election. I think it's about $100 a year or you could do a monthly subscription. I forget how much it is per month, but definitely go there, a lot of good information. This is an excerpt from his uh, intelligence report for today. There's just a little bit of it. There's a bunch of other information he gave. Texas National Guard readies for deployment. The Texas Army National Guard announced that up to 1,000 troops could be deployed ahead of Election Day. According to National Guard spokesperson Brandon Jones, no troops would be stationed at polling stations. I hope that's true. Troops could be sent to Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, and San Antonio as a continuation of peacekeeping efforts that began during anti-police protests this summer, according to Jones. The deployments could begin as soon as this weekend. This could be happening all around the country. Watch for deployments of National Guard troops. As the election nears, there is an increased concern about safety among voters. Law enforcement is attempting to keep a low profile, yet still provide safety and security to voters. The question of election site security was revealed, has revealed the patchwork of laws as they relate to polling site safety, firearms laws, and the buffer zones where armed individuals, including police, monitor the election. Other states, including Wisconsin and Kentucky, are quietly preparing similar deployments. See what I mean? It's going to be a number of states. It's not just Texas. There's a number of states that are deploying, probably starting this weekend, uh, similar deployments as a contingency for responding to potential unrest. And this also demonstrates that, uh, you know, when I say there's going to be a lot of unrest on, on election day, 
There's a lot of other people who think that too, including the people who deploy the National Guard. They think there's going to be a lot of civil unrest on Election Day. As we previously reported, the National Guard Bureau designated two military police units, one in Alabama and another in Arizona, as a rapid response to any state requesting assistance. The goal is to be anywhere in the U.S. within 24 hours of a governor's request. Alabama will handle the, handle the eastern half of the country and Arizona will respond to western states. According to recent reporting, some states plan to use their local guard troops in an unofficial capacity to replace poll workers? Wow. So it is going to be National Guard troops at the polls in an unofficial capacity to replace poll workers who are often older and at increased risk of illness due to COVID. Those troops will be dressed in civilian clothing, so you won't know that's the National Guard, and restricted to administrative duties like setting up tables and handing out ballots. But they're going to be there. The National Guard is going to be at the polls. Wow. Working out of uniform is intended to reduce voter intimidation concerns. Well, yeah, I mean, that'll help. My goodness. All right. I'm going to read a couple of the comments. Got a few more stories to get to. Uh, John Peterson, Laurel is right. I wonder what I was right about. <laughs> There's so many things. Uh, Jay Stimson, I'll email Laurel for your phone number. Okay, I'll give it to you. Uh, just, yeah. I will. I'm going to be giving out Black Magic's phone number. I hope I, I give it out to the right person. Because I see right now Jay Stimson, but am I going to remember that later? We'll see. Steve Pellis, Oregon Guard, had riot training last weekend. Well, inclusion, it's happening. Yep, I hope you're ready. Rice and beans. Uh, Black Magic, I'm trying to send a super chat, but everything I want Laurel to say is censored. <laughs> yeah, you know, the censors are saving me this time. Inclusion, do not trust the National Guard. Yeah, go back and watch my series. C.K. Quarterman, why can you not just shoot rioters? Shh. Alkman, uh, peacekeeping in Dem cities. Remember when we just peace kept places where genocide took place? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I like this answer. Kusumu Kajiro, C.K. Quarterman, because nobody can get the ammo. <laughs> They don't want to, what ammo they have, they don't want to waste it on the rioters. That's funny. Um, where was I? Rare test, no sugar. Oh, okay. So we're going to uh, Babulinski. Babulinski, Tony Babulinski is the former business associate of Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. And uh, he gave a press conference a couple of days ago, I guess about a week ago. And I showed excerpts of that on uh, the Sunday show. This is, he just did an interview with Tucker Carlson. Part of it was released yesterday and part of it is being released tonight. So I don't know whether it's actually been released yet, but this was some of the stuff that was released before. And he's making a really good point. He's saying, not only am I providing the testimony and all of this, I'm giving evidence too. I'm giving all of the cell phones that I have. There's plenty there to get the police started on an investigation. It's not just my word against theirs. I have the evidence, I've given it to them. And he's really shocked. He's very disappointed that the media is not covering the story and is saying that it's a Russian disinformation campaign. He's like, I'm not working for the Russians. So this is a little excerpt from, from the video and I recommend you watch the entire interview with Tucker Carlson. It would be different if this was my word against Jim Biden, Hunter Biden, and Joe Biden. Right. That would be a very slippery slope, not something I would take the personal and family risk on it. But I've provided more documents and facts that validate times, meetings, who participated. That email to me on May 13th was generated by somebody else sent to me. It wasn't me generating. These text messages that I've provided are Hunter Biden in the first person, Jim Biden in the first person, James Gillier in the first person, Rob Walker in the first person. It's not me generating the text messages. It's them speaking. So you can interview them. The FBI can interview them. Our government can interview them. But I was shocked that not only the media is not only discussing this, they're going to the other extreme. They're dismissing it as Russian disinformation. This country has heard enough about Russia. We went through three years of every day, Russia, Russia, Russia. It's just absurd. The Cold War is over. 
if he doesn't come out on record, I am uh, don't providing the fact. Tony, you're just going to just you. bury all of us, man. He has a really good point. He's providing all of this evidence that can be verified. Can be verified by looking at, uh, you know, where Hunter Biden was. Did, did he have a meeting at such and such a time? Did he find a place at such and such a time? There's just, especially compared to, oh, who, I can't even remember her name now. The, the woman who testified against um, Brett Kavanaugh. She had no corroborating evidence, nothing whatsoever. This guy, Bob Alinsky, has tons of it. He is, first of all, you can verify that they actually knew each other, that he is, he was in fact the CEO of Hunter Biden's company. Uh, so you can verify that they, they knew each other and they were business partners. So there's tons of stuff for an investigation and he's incredibly frustrated. Along those same lines, similar story, it's basically the same story. This is one of the leaked um, audio clips from Hunter Biden's laptop. So this has now been leaked to the press and it's Hunter Biden. There's a clicking noise in here and it sounds like Hunter Biden is hitting something against the table out of frustration and it's kind of annoying in the audio. But uh, this is Hunter Biden com complaining about uh, everything. Obviously it's not something recent. This is a little while ago, but this is, this clip confirms that Hunter Biden involved his father, or at least his father knew what was going on. I get calls from my father to tell me that the New York Times is calling, but my old partner, Eric, who literally has done me harm for I don't know how long, is the one taking the calls because my father will not stop sending the calls to Eric. I have another New York Times reporter calling about my representation of the, literally, Dr. Patrick Coe, the so Hunter Biden here admits that he's working with Chinese spies. Fucking spy chief of China. He started the company that my partner, who was worth $323 billion, found it. It is now missing. The richest man in the world is missing, who was my partner. He was missing since I last saw him in his $58 million apartment and signed a $4 billion deal to be, build the fucking largest fucking LNG port in the world. And I am receiving calls from the Southern District of New York, from the U.S. Attorney himself. My best friend in business, Devin, has named me as a witness without telling me. In a criminal case, and my father, without telling me, Oh, Hunter, Hunter, Hunter. What a mess. What a mess you got yourself in. So this all, this evidence looks really strong. It certainly looks stronger than anything that they ever had claimed to have against the president. Uh, let me pull this up. We just got a couple more stories. It's 8.43. I'm going to read comments uh, and we are going to go a little bit over. And there, there you go. I already went back there. Silver Hawk says, Laurel, check out CBN Christian News article before the polls close. Anti-Trump groups plot to shut down D.C. and spark national uprising after election. I got to get that contractor over here to finish up the house, man. I, I hope we have time for that. See, sometimes I, I, I oscillate between like, am I going to have time to finish, finish everything? And thinking... I, you know, maybe it's not going to be bad as I thought. And I'm, I'm just, I'm worrying for nothing and I'm spending too much time and money, all of this. So I kind of oscillate back and forth. It's better to be ready, but I got to get the contractor over here to finish that work. I don't want to be on pillars, uh, you know, have the kitchen jacked up for the next year or, or indefinitely. That's not going to work. <sighs> okay. Comments we got here. Uh, Mike Bondinsky, FYI, Carlson just tweeted moments ago that all Hunter Biden documents have disappeared. They were shipped from New York to Carlson in LA with a reputable shipping firm, but they were all lost in transit. What? Steve Pellis says, sweatneck. No, I was thinking about the woman who actually testified in front of Congress and she didn't have any evidence. Uh, obviously, Julie Sweatneck, but the other one, who I can't remember her name now. You know, the one who said it was indelible in a hippocampus. 
Dan the man, it's odd how Joe Biden is against fracking fossil fuels, but wants the sun, but wants the sun to get into oil and gas in other countries. Such a hypocrite. Yep. There you go. Augman says Christine Blasey Ford. Yeah, that's the one who had absolutely no evidence and they all just kind of believed her. And now that there's tons of evidence against Joe Biden and Hunter Biden, they're just not even talking about it, talking about it. They're not paying it any mind. I had previously told you guys that Jack Dorsey of uh, Twitter was being subpoenaed by the Senate to explain why he's been blocking this story on Twitter. So Ted Cruz finally brought him in and they, they also interviewed Mark Zuckerberg and whatever that guy's name is who's in charge of Google, not, not Sergey Brin and Larry Page, but the current CEO, the Indian guy. Um, but uh, Ted Cruz said the real problem is with Jack Dorsey. He's he's handled this much more poorly than than the other ones. So he really comes after Jack Dorsey. And in parts of the interview, I kind of or the uh, questioning, I kind of feel sorry for Jack Dorsey because Ted Cruz is hammering him pretty hard. But the opening question and Jack Dorsey's ridiculous answer to the first question make me feel a lot less sorry for him. Mr. Dorsey. Does Twitter have the ability to influence elections? No. No? <laughs> no? Now, I, I believe they don't determine elections, but do they influence? Of course they do. All social media does, all media does. Basically, a lot of things influence elections. And Twitter is one of the things. Now, I do think that people have the ability to think for themselves, but do they influence? Do they do they help? My son just said, no, they don't. Do they influence? Do they help sway? Of course they do. Of course they do. You don't believe Twitter has any ability to influence elections? No, we are one part of a spectrum of communication channels that people have. Two weeks ago, Twitter made the unilateral decision to censor the New York Post in a series of two blockbuster articles both alleging evidence of corruption against Joe Biden. The first concerning Ukraine, the second concerning communist China. And Twitter made the decision, number one, to prevent users, any user, from sharing those stories. And number two, you went even further and blocked the New York Post from sharing on Twitter its own reporting. Why did Twitter make the decision to censor the New York Post? Uh, we had a hack materials policy. So the policy is around um, limiting the spread of materials uh, that are hacked. There's no allegations that these materials have been hacked. The story that's been told is that Hunter Biden left the computer there and that it was then given to the police. To my knowledge, Hunter Biden has never said that any of this was hacked. Joe Biden has never said any of this has hacked. This is the first time I'm hearing that there's even that accusation out there. This seems a little uh, kind of reaching. Um, we didn't want Twitter to be a distributor for hack materials. Did Twitter block the distribution of the New York Times story a few weeks ago that purported to be based on copies of President Trump's tax returns? We didn't find that a violation of our terms of service and this policy in particular because it was reporting about the material. It wasn't distributing oh, the material. Okay. All right. So... There was, no, to my knowledge, no even allegations that uh, of any hacking against Hunter Biden. I don't think Hunter Biden has said that. Um, but clearly, President Trump didn't allow his tax returns to get out there. So to say that you blocked one because of hacking and didn't block the other because they weren't printing hacked material, I think that's pretty flimsy. So maybe Hunter Biden has said that, well, you know, Hunter Biden hasn't said the emails were hacked because then he'd be admitting that those were his emails. His position is those aren't his emails, to my, to my knowledge. Black Magic, he looks like a cult leader. You know, at first I liked the beard, but it doesn't look so good there. It's really, it looked good when he was on the Joe Rogan show. It didn't look good in, in that shot right there. But yeah, he does look like a cult leader. 
Uh, Jer- Gary Pastorchik, Jack wants to blend in with the junkies shitting on the sidewalk outside his corporate office. Apparently, Tazzy, while Peter Dinklage talking to Ted Cruz, I don't think he looks like Peter Dinklage. It's okay to be clown pilled. I eat so many beets. I wouldn't pass a pee test <laughs> if that is how people were tested to be in to be a Russian bot. Okay, I totally don't understand that, but it was still funny. Bill, the article was discussing the material and not distributing the material. So I presume you're talking about uh, the one for Hunter Biden, or are you talking about the one for President Trump's tax returns? Uh, so I, I see that Jack Dorsey is trying to make that dis- distinction. I think that's pretty flimsy. Okay, going, we just got a little bit left. It's 8.50. I'm going to keep going probably until 9 o'clock. I wanted to mention that uh, the stimulus bill that I was really hoping they would get out before the election, it seemed kind of silly to be postponing it till after the, the election. We got less than a week to go. And um, Trump has basically said at this point, like, there's no way. And I don't think it's an, even a matter of Trump saying, no, we're not going to do this until after the election. I think he used that, that as a bargaining tool before. But at this point, it's just like, we only got six days left. It's not going to happen. Come on. Uh, no second stimulus measure or direct payments will be approved before the election. President Trump conceded yesterday. Speaking to reporters at the White House, Trump said his administration will continue to negotiate but blamed Democrats for the failure to reach the agreement before November 3rd. They're both going to blame each other. Uh, they're going to blame each other and everybody else doesn't get the money. I would like them to lift all of the lockdown stuff so that we can earn our own money. But... They're printing it. They're giving it out. That there's people who have to have the money because they're the government's not allowing them to run their businesses. Um, but then also, as long as they're printing money, <laughs> they, I, I feel like the die is cast. You might as well print some for me too. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi is only interested in bailing out badly run crime ridden Democrat cities and states. That's all she's interested in. She is not interested in helping the people. After the election, we will get the best stimulus package you have ever seen. That totally sounds like Trump. Pelosi and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin have been meeting for weeks, including over an hour Monday, two days ago over a possible coronavirus stimulus package that includes aid for small businesses, the unemployed, state and local governments, and a national program of COVID testing and tracing. Both sides have previously agreed to include another round of direct payments up to $1,200 for individuals, same as before, $2,400 for married couples and with uh, $500 for dependents, like those sent in the early days of the coronavirus pandemic. All of that is on hold until at least November 3rd. So we shall see if that ever actually happens. Hopefully I could use another. I, with all of this construction going on, of course, everything, it always takes more money than you think it's going to take. So I could use another, uh, I could use another stimulus. One more story and then we'll call it a night. I'll, I'll read a couple super chats or, or other chats after this. But this is the story I was not able to get to on Sunday. Just very quickly, the Pope is now allowing uh, or wants same-sex civil unions. On any other day, the Pope's appearance in Vatican City without a mask on might have generated more headlines. But the Catholic leader had set the news agenda with his clearest pronouncement yet on gay relationships. In a documentary about his life which premiered at the Rome Film Festival, the pontiff said he thinks same-sex couples should be allowed to have civil unions. Telling filmmakers, homosexual people have the right to be a family. They are children of God. What we have to have is a civil union law. That way they are legally covered. He added that he'd stood up for that principle, apparently referring to his time as Archbishop of Buenos Aires, when he endorsed some legal protections for same-sex couples. And many will see his comments in the documentary as a major step forward. So there's that. <laughs> Let's look at a couple of the comments. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. It is, it is what it is. The Pope, uh, I mean, he didn't change any laws with that, but he said that he thinks it should be legal. Gary Pastorchik, no more cash giveaways, please. It, it's already, it's too late. You might as well, might as well print more. I mean, I don't think you can stop this boulder from rolling down the hill. 
Black magic beats are nature's candy. Kami Russians something. It went up. Beats are nature's candy. Kami Russians gave them a bad name. Uh, <laughs> Black magic says, I know, right? Our budget is fucked. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it's just it, everybody else is looting. I'm standing outside of, of the store that's being looted. You know, all right, throw me throw me a piece of whatever you guys. I don't know. This is not a good analogy. I'm going to stop that analogy. Forget that one. Because if they were looting, I would actually leave the area. So it's not a good analogy. Inclusion, he, inclusion. He is not allowing or wanting same sex civil unions. He said he thinks they should be allowed. So he doesn't have any control over the law, except maybe in Vatican City. So he can't make them legal. Um, but he said he thinks they should be allowed. And that, that's what it was. Black magic, good thing I'm not Catholic. That guy is the tr is treating the papacy like political office, apparently. Uh, inclusion, let's read this one. He has spoken against them many times. He said that civil unions were an option only as opposed to homosexuals blaspheming real marriage. He doesn't promote it. I don't know, saying he thinks that they should be allowed. It, it sounds like he thinks they should be legally allowed. Uh, Isaac says, always <clears throat> 10 years behind whatever the liberal churches do. Mm. Okay, I have to do the other comment first. Isaac says, Catholics are the Republicans of Christianity, always 10 years behind whatever the liberal, liberal churches do. Uh, inclusion says, Laurel, he did not say they should be allowed. Mistranslated and edited clip, clip, he took multiple sentences from different spots. There were a lot of places reporting on that. I'll go back and I'll double check and I'll report again on Sunday, but there were a number of places saying, unless you're saying that um, it's the uh, documentary that's misquoting everybody else is just saying what was in the documentary. I'll take a look and see if, if the Pope has commented on it, on uh, those stories since then. Okay. But I'm going to wrap it up because Matt and Blonde's show does start in just a couple of minutes. I might come for a little bit because the Wednesday show actually isn't as good as their Sunday show. But uh, I'm still going to go. So there it is. I think I'll just go for a little bit because um, I got emails from clients that's like, have you done this? And I'm like, no. So there's a couple of things I need to do for clients before I go to bed tonight. Uh, anyway, good show tonight, guys. And uh, spend your last few days of prepping wisely. There's not a lot of time left. Things are about to get super, super crazy. Have a good night.